Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon, episode 38, General Robert Crawford, also known as Black Bob Crawford of the British Army. We have a special guest for this episode on Black Bob Crawford. Our good friend Marcus Cribb is joining us for the third time. Thank you very much. I always love your intros. Uh, you've got a great, great way of being to this. But, and, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me back for the third one. No, my pleasure. And uh, interesting character, this Black Bob Crawford. I was talking to you earlier. I was reading some articles on him and you really couldn't make this guy up in a, like a dime store novel. He was just incredible. He's really different to the ones we've covered so far. And I would say probably a bit more on the controversial scale here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's got some things to, to like and some things to loathe. All right. Well, before we jump into them, let's talk about a few things. Um, I'll talk about the first one, which I think is really intriguing. June 18th of this year, if you've never been to the Waterloo battlefield in Belgium there, uh, there's a tour of the battlefield that Marcus is doing for free. And you can learn all about it on eventbrite.com if you want to join Marcus for that tour, which I think would be really neat. Um, the second one is even more incredible, if you want to touch on that one, Marcus. Thank you. Yes. So as well as uh, going to Waterloo and pottering around with me uh, just to be there on the anniversary, uh, in September this year, myself and Dan Hill, who's an excellent military historian and a battlefield guide, uh, we're taking a group over to Portugal and Spain and doing some of the highlights of the, especially the early Peninsula War. So starts in uh, Lisbon, uh, doing Releasa, Vimero, uh, Porto, which kind of, I joke, say is my battle. So I'll give you a, a walking tour of how uh, they crossed the Giro. Yeah. Off to uh, Bucasso, Suidad Rodrigo. We'll do Badajoz and a few other places uh, in between, including the cemetery at Elvas. So uh, be, yeah. a, be a really good two nights in each place. So we're not on the road too much. You know, there's a chance there to unpack and have a drink and uh, relax and have a chat to like-minded people in the evenings as well. Yeah, and, and you're uh, not just visiting battlefields. You can see the cities as well. So We're going to see the cities. I mean, yeah, you start and finish in Lisbon, which is just as a tourist, it's just a beautiful, beautiful capital city. But we've got really good interest. You know, we're definitely doing it and uh, really looking forward to that one. All and right. to being back out there uh, on the on the Coa River, on the Juro River, and those kind of scenic areas are just beautiful, beautiful to see. Yeah. Just to your side. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. No, I'm, I'm very interested in that one. Uh, if you need more information, I think you can go to dukeofwellington.org for that one. Thank you. Yes, I always put everything on my uh, my little sites. Uh, that's that's all on there, both uh, both in June and September, both the tours are on uh, DukeWellington.org. All right. And one more shout out, of course, for our uh, uh, Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves charity that you and I are both a member of. Um, I'd like Thank people you. To check, yes. check that out as well. Please do. Please do support us, uh, become a member, and uh, we, we wouldn't say no to a, a donation or two, if I'm going to be brutally honest. Uh, we're a charity, uh, and we've already started now uh, on multiple grave restorations and have yep. some really interesting projects in the pipeline. Yep. Uh, but we started with a, a chap who was at Trafalgar, and we've recently restored some graves of French prisoners of war in England. Yes. And uh, we've got some international ones that we want to do as well. So this is not just a British and it's not just, you know, the Brits doing the Brits. We're an international charity right. and we're looking at international people involved. And uh, if, you know, there is no limit to that. I love that one. All right. Well, let's jump into our subject matter here. Um, Robert Crawford was born in May 1764 in Newark Castle. And I'll let you handle the pronunciation of the city in England. In Ayrshire. Thank you. And uh, he was the third son of Sir Alexander Crawford, who was a baronet in the British aristocracy. Um, can you tell us a bit about his upbringing? Yes, yeah, so Ayrshire, so we're, we're north of the border now. So we're into Scotland. Uh, obviously, at the time, actually, they did, they did call it England. Um, in the contemporary uh, period, which is slightly confusing and a bit controversial today, but uh, we're <laughs> north of the border. We're into uh, Scottish uh, baronetcy, uh, okay. so we've got uh, a knight, effectively. It's the lowest mm -hmm. level of the aristocracy uh, there, and uh, that's where he grew up, relatively uh, relatively rural. Uh, he is coming again from the aristoc aristocratic stock uh, that yep. we see with a lot of generals uh, within the British military at the time. It's quite typical, and yeah. uh, he's one of a few brothers. Yeah, and as we mentioned earlier, because he is the third son and not the first son, he's going to have to work for what he gets, correct? He is. So uh, they often say that the, the first one's going to kind of 
you know, run the farm, run the estate, bring up the house, and they've got that sorted. Mm -hmm. uh, the second and third ones really are kind of destined for the military or politics to bring up their own. And it, the, the joke used to be that if they ended up with a fourth or fifth, one of them would go for the clergy to pray for the souls of the other <laughs> ones so they could, uh, to do what they needed to. Uh, I've never heard that. That's good. Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an old joke from the time, uh, but yeah. you'll see that often if you these larger families, if they've got five or six sons, that one of them will do, join the clergy, yeah. uh, and because it's a respectable career. Sure. Uh, but young uh, young Robert Bob Crawford uh, has uh, kind of his eyes on the military. And I, I assume he has a receives good education. He's aristocracy, so um, I, I imagine he does quite. He, he at least gets a sound education growing up. He does. He's uh, he's going to um, uh, school uh, both in uh, Scotland and then down uh, on the kind of further south into England for his his kind of formal education, which is quite short. Because mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I know we've mentioned it before, but it's worth stressing. This is normal. He's purchased uh, his way into the army, so that's right. how it, that's how it works. There's a whole belief that you are supporting the, the kind of in, the institution of the, the British politics and the military. And you buy your way in. Uh, it's more expensive to join the guards or the cavalry, for example. Um, yeah. the, the odd ones out are the engineers and the artillery. You're trained to go in at that point. Yeah. Uh, it looks like he joins the military at 15 and lists in 25th foot. Yeah, right. 15. It's very, very young. So the regiment become the King's Own Scottish Borderers, but the 15th regiment, so the 25th regiment foot at 15 years old. So he's, he's young. He's not mm -hmm. going to be one of the youngest, uh, but he's certainly going to be, you know, he's a boy. He's 15 yeah. years old. Yeah, uh, but as an ensign. But the intriguing thing, by 19, he's a company commander. Um, but again, this is you and I talked about this. Did he get promoted on his ability or his aristocratic background? Uh, as far as I'm aware, here it's really going to be down to him purchasing his way up. So it's, it's yeah. his money and the status there that's going up. Um, so a company at the time is going to have uh, a captain commanding it. And then, uh, depending on the unit, you'll have two to four, usually uh, two uh, subalterns, so lieutenants or ensigns uh, there to help command the day-to-day -day running of the uh, the units as a subunit. Uh, so the company commander actually has a lot more autonomy. Uh, there's not really a, a status above that before the battalion commander. Uh, so by 19, he's a captain and is got, you know, yeah. on paper, 100 men under his command. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, a company roughly is about 100 soldiers and... Uh... Yeah, like, you know, he was well-educated, he spoke German, you know, it seems like he was a bright guy. I don't know if he was Black Bob just yet, though. He was probably too young for that. Yeah, and he certainly hasn't got the nickname. Yeah, he spent some time in Berlin and uh, and picks up uh, some German from that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the nickname doesn't come in until at least, mostly I've got the peninsula. Uh, yeah. Where it really kind of comes up as his, his reputation. So at this point, it's quite, a, it's quite a typical upbringing for a Scottish aristocrat, really. Okay. So and by 1787, he's a captain in the 75th Regiment, and he doesn't see his first action in Europe. Uh, where does he get his first, I guess, baptism of fire? Yeah, so we're at the kind of the heights of the, the British Empire here. So he's with uh, Lord Cornwallis, and he's off in, he's in India. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a campaign uh, over there. He's not actually in India for that long compared to uh, some others. He's, only, he's actually... Uh, back in the UK, uh, in Ireland by 1798. Uh, mm -hmm. But he's with the famous uh, Cornwallis uh, over there mm -hmm. and uh, kind of expanding the British Empire and the colonialism of the time. Right, right. And from there, though, uh, you mentioned he wasn't there that long. In 1798, he's helping to suppress a rebellion in Ireland under General Lake. So it seems like he's getting a very worldly military education at this point. Yeah, he comes back. Uh, he has some time... I believe in Austria uh, for a short amount of time. And he, he does some studying uh, with, you know, uh, especially at the time we had the Prussian system and the, the Germans are thought of as being kind of the way to go for studying military. And yeah. he comes back via there to, to Ireland, to General Lake, uh, putting down, uh, I think, the 1798 rebellion, which is Wolf Tone's uh, rebellion. Yeah. He was a very famous uh, national uh, leader of the Irish cause, uh, who was eventually captured at the end of that uh, kind of rebellion uprising, uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, famously kind of getting uh, battles 
uh, involving British against Irish troops and Irish troops who have been part of the British uh, militia and yeomanry at the time. There's some engravings of them fighting on both sides. And uh, he, he was part of that. You know, this is um, a very dark times for Irish history. And it split down cousin to cousin, different lines there with the British right. military playing a, a very important part on, you know, suppressing that really and yeah. that's what he had to do and does it very well uh he's uh he's there with general lake and he's um he's leading troops and is on the staff as well so uh i think he's mostly general lake staff officer showing his abilities then to work at a higher level above his rank which is quite important for his later uh works yeah and uh, you mentioned you know his experience in uh you know learning from the prussians and different militaries it seems like Kind of like Napoleon and Wellington, he hated inefficiency or, or when the army wasn't working at its fullest capacity, it seemed to really bother him. Yeah, and I think this is probably the early parts of his temper uh, that kind of comes in. He's somebody there that has a famous uh, rage and this starts to come out at this kind of stage. You don't really want to show it when you're a junior ensign or lieutenant that you're so easily bothered and rageful. But when you start to work your way up as a staff officer, uh, I think he gets to Deputy Assistant Adjutant General, one of those kind of longer titles. Yeah. Uh, he he can actually show his frustration because he's at a position now that's kind of quite yeah. higher up and he's, and he's got a way to kind of influence people. Yeah, and, and I remember um, Napoleon pulled aside both Marshal Lon and Marshal Ney and said, hey, you know, you can't be a great leader of men if you have this horrible temper. And I, I remember Lon really working on it and Ney not so much. But... <laughs> I, I think that, you know, that that is an important piece. Like you can't just fly off the handle whenever something goes bad for you. No. And, you know, Nave's kind of one of those ones that's more famous for it, you know, Brave to the Brave, but really fiery temper. And I think Crawford's probably up there as a kind of a, a contemporary comparison for Ney mm -hmm. uh, with leading different units and also having that uh, subunit command and having certainly the temper that he's got but he's also you know he's very skilled and yep. his language really has got him that some basic training outside of the British military and, and puts him a really strange one to uh to Switzerland as well yeah uh, just after Ireland he ends up with I think like a, a Russian expedition into Switzerland mm -hmm. and then uh, follows them into the Netherlands mm -hmm. uh, with the Russians and the Duke of York uh, mm -hmm. invading the Netherlands low country, which is where we get the, the nursery rhyme, the Grand Old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. Yeah, <laughs> that's, he, he's on that where they're kind of marching around the low countries on the, as a staff officer. So he's yeah. getting quite a lot of uh, experience at quite an early stage. You know, we've got an, We've got India, Ireland, Switzerland, and the Netherlands okay. already. And on the, the lighter side, uh, in 1800, he gets married to Mary Frances. Um, can you tell us a bit about their marriage? It seems like a pretty happy one. They seem to have one of these kind of rare things of a happy marriage at this time. Yeah. Uh, they seem to be quite well uh, suited. Uh, there's not much about Mary Frances, but I found she was the uh, granddaughter of Capability Brown, Lancelot Brown, who's a really famous uh, landscape designer in England at the time. Mm -hmm. He does all of these massive parks and landscapes outside of country houses, such as like Chatsworth House, uh, famous for Pride and Prejudice, and uh, the, mm -hmm. the Duke of Devonshire. And he was kind of mid, kind of mid to early 1700s, and he kind of came along and just did huge, huge uh, landscape projects, digging lakes and rebuilding artificial hills, for, mostly for the, the, the wealthiest aristocracy. Of course. And, uh, very, you know, when you go to these beautiful places like Chatsworth, Blenheim, you, you see the capability Brown. His real name is Lancelot. One of these few names, sorry, Lancelot Brown, that I think actually his first name is possibly better than his nickname. Right. Because uh, it's Lancelot. Yeah. Um, but she's the, uh, she's the granddaughter of, of him. Yeah. No. And uh, so they've got, some, they've got some money from, uh, from there. But uh, they, seem to, they seem to get on quite well. Uh, and they do later have a, a son who I believe is born in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they had a couple of kids. And I, I find it interesting that he regularly requested Frillo to see her. And sometimes he didn't even te tell Wellington he was going to go see her. He would just take off. Uh, that's, I mean, it's, it's not an ideal situation, but it's quite endearing. Yeah. But actually, he seems to, uh, to care about his wife. The other one that really seems to come out as a love story is uh, General uh, Graham, Thomas, uh, Thomas Graham who mm -hmm. kind of fights his own personal war against the French revolutionaries because of his uh, love of his wife. Yes. Yeah, story, story for another time. Maybe. Yeah, no, that's a, that is a great story. Absolutely. Um, so getting back to our protagonist, in 1805, uh, Crawford's promoted to full colonel. 
Mm-hmm. It's important in the ill-fated expedition of Buenos Aires. Can you, and I hate to go down rabbit holes, but this is, I think it's an important part of his story. Can you give us an overview of kind of a quick overview of what happened there? I will do my best, of course. Right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so he goes to full colonel. So you are saying earlier, you promote your way up to a lieutenant colonel with rank, one rank below. Yep. And uh, to uh, to put it into um, context for American uh, friends and listeners, that's, this is full bird colonel. That's right. And uh, from this point onwards, you can only move up by ability, really. Yep. Yep. And uh, yeah, we, we've decided to take the war to Spain. So if we, we park what we know later about uh, the Peninsula War and Spain being our allies, this is the difficult in-between bit just after Trafalgar. Right. And it's, you can see why it makes it so difficult in the Peninsula War and Spain are our allies just one or two years later. Yeah. Because uh, we're deciding to take the, fr- the, sp- the fight to the Spanish by going into South America. So uh, it's often known as the River Plate uh, Expedition. It's got a couple of different names. And uh, this is where but they are current, going current in. Argentina and Chile. Argentina and Chile in, in modern day, um, uh, yeah, Buenos Aires, uh, yep. Argentina, Uruguay. And it's kind of a, the, basically the Spanish colonies over there. And we're mm-hmm. going in to, to cause a lot of trouble, really. Um, <laughs> the eyes are on Buenos Aires. And I think the ultimate aim was to force a capitulation of South America, uh, which is... Kite was actually where Wellesley later was being eyed up for another one, uh, but they don't go very well. Mm-hmm. Um, we end up with uh, Beresford, uh, one of Wellington's right hand men, having to uh, surrender, uh, supported you know hugely by uh, Royal Navy uh, and uh, Homewick's Popham, and uh, they're going in. And there's there's certainly lots of fighting, lots of uh, lots of incidents. Uh, along the coast for, between uh, Montevideo and Buenos Aires and going in. Mm-hmm. But the uh, British just do not pull this one out of the bag mm-hmm. uh, and ended up kind of cap in hand having to surrender. Yeah. And, and, and organizing a, a way to get back. Yeah, it seems Crawford performed well, but he, he accused of his, his commander in chief of cowardice and being a traitor. So I, it just sounds like, you know, the Spanish army there was fighting well. They had, uh, you know, just some good strat, some good generals on their side, but on the British side, um, yeah, just it sounds like Crawford wasn't too pleased with his commander in chief. No, and it really won that when you read the list that you say, um, these generals you've got Gen- Dennis Pack, who later on is in the peninsula, famously at Waterloo, um, and Beresford himself, he's a really good administrator, and uh, we'll talk about him another time, certainly in uh, relation to uh, the peninsula war, but. We just, it doesn't come out. The the Spanish, I think we're expecting a bit of like the you know, local uprising. Right. Um, and that doesn't take place. You know, the Spanish have got the area like kind of locked down. Mm-hmm. And uh, we end up with street fighting, uh, rooftop to rooftops. Uh, there's famously an incident that involves uh, Thomas Plunkett, who's a 95th rifleman, uh, who will come feature uh, later and who's uh, shooting Spanish officers down the street. Yep. Uh, so there's some quite brutal fighting, but the mm-hmm. numbers, the numbers are on the Spanish side soon, you know, effectively is there like local, uh, local area. I'm not going to say home turf because they are, <laughs> they have invaded there and right, right, yeah. centuries sure. earlier, but, but they're, yep. they're, they're embedded into the local um, culture Correct. and area yep. by this point. Yep. So from there in 1808, um, moving forward in our story, Crawford, sails to Corona, Spain to serve under Sir John Moore in the fight against Napoleon's armies that are now in Spain. Um, do you want to kind of walk us through that part of it? Yeah, so this is where we get deeper into the, the Peninsula War itself now. So uh, he's, he lands in uh, Corona, which is where uh, I mentioned in the first podcast, that's where Wellesley, later Wellington, lands and is waved away from. So it's in the, the northwest of Spain. Correct. And Sir John Moore has now taken over from uh, Wellesley, uh, having to come back after the Convention of Sintra. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, moved as far down as Salamanca, uh, way before the famous Bassa of Salamanca, but it's the kind of dropping off point. Uh, this is where he receives his intelligence from Major Waters and <laughs> realises that he's about to be surrounded by uh, both Soult's and uh, kind of Napoleon's main force, actually. Yep. coming in yep. and uh, they're going to one of those forces actually facing him would have outdone him uh, outmatched him really but both would have just been too much too yeah. much I, I would I would hasten to say it probably wouldn't even been a massacre they would have almost had to surrender before uh, both surrounded or they would have just been forced into uh, into any sort of kind of prisoner right uh, situation so they make this decision to head back towards the coast 
Now, this is where Crawford really steps up. He's put in a brigade command of the Light Brigade, as they are at the time, but later the Light Division. And they form the rear guard, or part of the rear guard, uh, right. to give to give other units their, their due credit. There's certainly uh, some famous Highlanders uh, sure. there. Sure. And uh, this is this is the rear guard action, and there's beautiful uh, paintings of this uh, where they they go forwards and backwards. Uh, more, <laughs> what I say that is Crawford actually marches ahead of the army at one point, and Moore recalls him. I think on Christmas Eve to yeah. actually form the rear guard. Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify, and everywhere else, podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've really enjoyed the ease of use and the distribution ability of this platform. And this is really important that these men are formed up into the units mm -hmm. and fight in the rear guard when we're in Spanish winter. I say we're basically yeah. Christmas Eve onto to mid January is this rear guard. Yeah. And they have and limited deep snow. Yeah, limited supplies, limited forage, and they're not up against some chump. I mean, Marshall Salt's one of the, the brightest that Napoleon has. Uh, Marshall Salt is is very capable. Yeah. Uh, he's really up there as being a great general. Um, I think we've touched on him before. He's he's a looter. Yes. Uh, and he's certainly got political aspirations as well. Yeah. Uh, but he he manages to do uh, he manages to kind of get the jump on more. And mm. certainly at this point, Saul is on top of his game. I would argue harshly against Moore here. Uh, on reflection, you know, everyone kind of holds Moore as quite a hero. Right. Uh, I think he's kind of made massive mistakes uh, during this campaign. Mm -hmm. And he's, if he hadn't got intelligence from Major Waters, uh, an exploring officer, he would have been uh, captured. Right. Uh, I think if Moore had survived, he probably would have faced court martial back in the UK. Mm. Um, Wellington did after the conviction of Sintra and was exonerated. Now, it doesn't mean that Moore wouldn't have been exonerated for political reasons. Yeah, um, but I think he certainly would have uh, had to have faced a serious questions about the decisions he made to go into Spain uh, rather than staying into Portugal. Uh, the way that his Spanish allies, who you know, for reasons that we we're just covering about things like the River Plate expedition, are very difficult to work with. Yeah, um, but he does not manage it in the same way that Wellesley does. Well, I'd like to really call out Crawford's work on the rear guard here. And I think it's around this time that he gets his Black Bob nickname, correct? I think this is basically where it's starting to, to come in. Mm -hmm. um, he's uh, He does actually flog some of the men uh, during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, really, di really difficult situations that they're in. Um, yeah. He's keeping discipline kind of by the boot and the lash, yeah. as they say. And yeah. um, there's a bit of a thing, a bit of a, a misdemeanor amongst the... Um, the 95th rifles that oh we weren't flogged or they weren't flogged no they were um mm -hmm. they certainly were like many of the other men you know they were they were rebels uh, when they were able to be and uh would certainly you know steal a chicken from a farm here and there to feed themselves yeah uh, but what crawford does is he holds them to a really really high standard when the rest of the army is kind of like pack on head down trudge as much as they can yeah. and it is a trudge across really difficult um, circumstances i don't know if i've mentioned this little anecdote before but there is uh, at least one or two ladies that i've read about who literally give birth by the side of the road pick up the newborn baby and and, and their husband's pack because he's like broken these are like 50 kilogram packs they're not right. though they look quite small they've got the whole lives in them yeah i'm glad you brought that up because that just shows like what a rush they were in like it, i mean well, you know, why do why are there ladies along? Well, some of the, the, the officers brought their wives and that kind of thing. But yeah, it, the, the, some of the men would have their wives by ballot. And yeah, they, these ladies are really, really tough and determined yeah. and are well, massively helping their, their men folk out. 
Yeah, and he was known for his ill temper and to be quick with the lashings, like you said, for, quote, willfulness and folly, end quote. Um, so I, I assume like men, like you said, were out forging without permission or stepping out of line when he's... Almost like, certainly all the time. Yeah. But he manages to hold them together. They have rear guard actions. Uh, and if I can quickly mention that it's hard to mention uh, the retreat to Corona without mentioning uh, Thomas Plunkett. Yes. Um, so this is a rifleman who uh, shoots... Uh, General Colbert, he he does it in what they call the supine position, so that's lying back uh, with the the rifle up. Your, your favorite, feet. yeah, yeah, it's favorite one. It's my it's my cover photo of me recreating it on uh, on Twitter for those who haven't seen. Sure. Uh, and it's really stable. I can literally say that from experience. You know, I haven't live fired it, but actually, you can you can shoot like that really comfortably. Yeah. You yeah. can't do that with a modern uh, assault rifle. I'm mean, I'm in the army reserves, and it's not something you can uh, you can replicate. But it's a bit like having your own movable uh, bipod. Yeah. Uh, he shoot he shoots Colbert, uh, and then his aide, sometimes labelled a trumpeter, uh, comes across. He shoots him as well. The, the distance is massively disputed. Some people have said 600 yards. That's mm. probably not true. Some people have said it's like 150. The truth is probably in the middle, as always, about 300 yards, which is a good distance for um, a Baker rifle. It was quite a rear guard defense. Um, but oddly, you know, his men, even though with the lashings and the, the temper and the violent language, they still liked him for yeah. his determination. I think it's that kind of element of kind of, it's, it's that respect. Yeah. Um, you're respecting the fact that he's delivering a formed army into the field. And that's going to be really valued because the, op the other option is to turn around and just trudge. Yeah. And, and then it, you've got French cavalry on your heels. Yeah. And I read that, you know, he yelled at officers and the men alike, which the officers probably didn't like because they're, you know, they're aristocracy as well. Yes. But, yeah. Um, but I also read that um, Wellington when he took over the army, he only offered explanation and discussion to three generals, uh, Hill, Beresford, and Black Bob. The other, the other generals, he just said, here's your orders, I don't wanna talk about it. So I thought that just shows the respect that this guy earned. He, I think he's earning his respect in the retreat to Corona, like mm -hmm. very few others have. Yep. And um, okay. we touched on Beresford, uh, and you know I'm a big fan of Hill, uh, yep. we did him last time. And uh, I cannot think of two men that are much more different though, that Crawford, yeah. Yeah. who's swearing and lashing people, yeah. like Bob, he's got his nickname, and then Daddy Hill, because his men love him because he's calm, he's not a flogger. And right. I, don't get me wrong, I know where I'd like to be. I'd yeah. like to be with Hill being yeah. not being lashed. <laughs> However, there are different styles of leadership and command that both can have some good end results. Yeah, agreed. So obviously, Corona, you know, the British escape, but they come back in 1809, um, this time mm -hmm. in Portugal with the future Duke of Wellington. Yes. And he's, he was given command of the light division. I know we, that he had some command, like temporary command of it on the on the rear guard, which is composed of elite foot soldiers of the time. Can you give us a quick breakdown of both the light division? I know there's the King's German Legion and there's the buffs. It seems like they're all elite. Are they? Is, is the light division really the elite division? Yes, you open a can of worms. Um, <laughs> and whatever I say, I'm going to be damned if I do and damned if I don't. But yes, the Elite Division are have do receive additional training, which I think would mark them out as elite. If I have to, if I have to decide, I would say yes, they are elite. Okay. Um, a, a very fun of the buffs, but they're not elite. They're line infantry. Uh, the difference has become the Light Division, uh, which was the Light Brigade and the uh, retreats, and it's expanded out to division now. Uh, they receive additional training. The, the main uh, units, which is the 43rd and the 52nd Light Infantry, supplemented with uh, men of the 95th Rifles, but they are given additional training. Now, that's not actually as new as it sounds. Uh, there's men of the uh, 5th, 60th Rifles, uh, the Royal American Rifles, there's King's German Legion, and they're each battalion has a light company mm -hmm. but what it's doing is forming them into a main body and taking what their lessons that they've learned about skirmishing uh we we basically learned a load of lessons in the american revolution uh took them to a really high level with like the rangers and things like that and then kind of forgot the main lessons that have been learned mm -hmm. in the intervening uh, 50 or so years and then kind of relearning them again uh, relearning them in the south of england uh, drilling them and it drills down to having men that you trust below even NCO command. So mm -hmm. when you've got the kind of the, the main line infantry, all, all of the orders are really being given by the captains, the lieutenants, they're being pushed into line uh, by the sergeants. Mm -hmm. 
Skirmishing is different. It is being down into pairs or sections. So a section probably typically commanded by a corporal of about 10 men. Right. Who are then breaking down into pairs. And this is very much like modern military. It's pair fire maneuver. One of you is going to be lining up your shot and taking a shot at somebody, whilst the other one dashes forward to the next bush, stone bit of cover. Yeah. And then they're taking turns to reload. Yeah. So it takes a lot longer to reload. But it's people who've got initiative. They can think on their feet. And uh, that's what is pushing rather than kind of that drilled discipline. Right. Ironically, Black Bob Crawford is one for the most discipline in the line. So he's forming these men who are very smart mm -hmm. into kind of really rough diamonds. And yeah. I think that's where his nickname comes in. They're, gr they're grudging respect for somebody who's taking them and they're being told you're the new guys, you are the elite. And then forming them into something that's a really usable um, force rather than just going off and being some sort of special forces. They're not that at all. They're, they're used as a large part of the army. Right. And I, I think that just shows uh, the Duke of Wellington's opinion of Black Bob if he gave him this, this special unit to, to come in. Yes. And he doesn't have that background. You know, there's um, certainly lots of Germans in the army, uh, in the British army at the time, who have more uh, experience with this kind of training and warfare. Uh, so if, I think there's, there's something that Wellington Wellesley uh, sees in him. Uh, that takes him forwards partially you know he's he's studied prussian methods in in austria and berlin he's been out in india he's been in ireland he's actually got quite and obviously south america he's got quite good experience at this point yeah now i'm glad you brought that up because this is something i want to touch on he is a few years older than wellington hill barrister all these guys yet he's a lower ranked general than all of those guys do you think there were some animosity there or did that bother Crawford do you think I've, I've not seen anything come up he's uh what five years five years older than Wellesley yeah um well that makes him five years older than uh, Napoleon uh for context <laughs> yeah and uh you know some of those people have gone on he is he's a general mm -hmm. uh he's a major general at this point uh so kind of the lower the lower rung of generalship yeah uh, Maybe he had resentment, but I think actually his anger comes from being an angry man uh, <laughs> rather than a full career. I don't think I would have seen him as somebody who's uh, ever would have got the top job. Mm -hmm. And I don't see him as a political animal either. Mm -hmm. uh, not from not from what I've read. But that'd be, that'd be interesting to know uh, if it, there was something going on kind of within layers, more subtle going down that's motivating his his famous temper. Correct. Yeah. Well, um, I guess going back to our story, he's assigned in Portugal to guard almost like a 40 mile border of Portugal against the French in Spain. And he does quite well in that. Yeah, this is where um, we're kind of the light division really coming to themselves. Um, the countryside's made for it in their defense. Um, early on in the campaign, there's a very little talked about unit called the Loyal Lusitanian Legion, uh, which is a brigade of uh, Portuguese with uh, quite a few British officers who do a similar job. Uh, and they go up into the Portuguese mountains. Um, and it's, you know, why Portugal's managed to stay independent from Spain so long. These mountain forts and uh, little outcrops are very good. But the light division gets into there and uh, they, they hold back the French for a long time until uh, until the Coa. Yeah, yeah. The combat of Coa, 1810. Um, he bumps into our uh, hot-headed uh, general, Marshal Ney, and he has a bit of a setback there. What, what happens in that uh, engagement? Uh, this is where it does go quite wrong. Uh, so uh, Crawford, for one reason or another, is almost literally caught napping. Uh, he's uh, not giving out the command and control that's needed for his unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, A comes in over the uh, fort of Almeida and uh, kind of it sweeps around this uh, beautiful Portuguese star fort. And they, they sweep around the side of it and the light division initially fall back. And there's just not the orders from uh, Crawford that's needed. Ney's kind of forcing people forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about them both earlier. It's really interesting that they actually kind of almost meet, uh, yeah. certainly meet on the battlefield. Yeah. Um, I see they've got quite similar styles. And, and Crawford, as, as far as I can tell, basically stalls and starts to withdraw. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where actually the discipline of the, and the training of the men really comes into effect. Mm -hmm. um, the Coa, it is just beautiful. This is like this ravine. They come tumbling down this ravine and it's got one narrow medieval bridge across it mm -hmm. so what happens is uh, a lot of the uh, light infantry i think mostly from the 43rd uh, turn around and perform a counter-attack back up the slope they've just run down yeah. uh, across, against the french and force the uh, force them back 
at which yeah. point uh, the the rest of the troops, which is largely the 95th and also some Portuguese uh, like Cacadors, uh, which are their light infantry, form back across this river. And when you go there, the river's a good couple of dozen meters wide, but it's so rocky, you wouldn't be able to jump from rock to rock with hobnail boots on. It just would not be possible. Mm -hmm. So the only routes over this bridge. Uh, Crawford's uh, back with them there once they've turned back round, and they turn around and open fire across this bridge, and it's a real bottleneck. The 43rd uh, managed to um, cross back, so you've got all of the Allies on one side and the French on a on a truck kind of size bridge. You know, modern modern haulage truck is about the width, right? And it's got low stone sides, and now all in the rocks slightly above you that you're running towards are uh, riflemen and light infantry. And even light infantry, uh, they are fought, they are trained to fight uh, at this kind of battle. Mm -hmm. They've got, uh, they've actually got two sights on their musket. They issued a different musket to the line infantry. I don't know if people realize. So they've got a front and back uh, marker on their musket. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas normal uh, muskets at the time just had a little front, like kind of nub to kind yeah. of point in the rough direction. Yeah. And they are causing heavy casualties and the French are not able to get over this bridge. Yeah. And, when you see the bridge in real life, uh, you can massively uh, see why. Uh, and to kind of, if people want to know more, um, I think it's currently pinned to my Twitter page. I've got a load of videos, and one of them is me running across this bridge. <laughs> I, I got really carried away. I just, it's something you can really imagine why uh, it was a really defensible point. Yeah. And, and, and Marshall knows what you want to say about him. The guy was good at rear guard ambushes. And I oh, think, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah and, uh, I believe Wellington reprimanded Black Bob after this, though. He wasn't yeah, he, yeah, he gets reprimanded for this. And I think if it wasn't for, A, his men uh, who pull it out of the bag, and B, that bridge being there, uh, mm. if they if it had been just a big, wide, plain battlefield, they mm. would have continued to kind of steamroll over them. This mm. bridge, coupled with the men's training and determination and bravery, mm -hmm. forces a victory there. I, I cannot tell you, though, sadly, why this goes wrong for Black Bob personally right. uh it's it's not a heavy defeat for the british no it's you know it's, like, it's a badly run rear guard yeah but why is it badly run why does he it, not yeah it's a few hundred lost on each side so it's not a huge like set piece battle but uh no. it's still, yeah it's still a setback uh for it's his, definitely a setback yeah his career um so after that it looks like he gets some r and r and then almost like a champion coming out of the locker room <laughs> the state <laughs> To save like a battle, he comes back in 1811 at the Battle of Fuentes de Anoro. Can you, can you describe this one to me? Yeah. Um, so you're, you're you're seeing him emptying the the ring with his um, "I Have a Tiger" music yeah, here. Is that, yeah, is that what you've got? Yeah. It's, Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Rocky Balboa himself. Um, so uh, Fuentes de Anoro. Um, this is another one, just actually a walking distance um, from. Uh, Coa and Almeida and um, Suda and Rodrigo, there's, uh, it's between the two. And it's just, just inside the Spanish border. The Coa is just inside the Portuguese border. And there's a lot of these Portuguese battles take place in this kind of throw stone in that area. It's, uh, it's fascinating countryside. And so this is to do with the, uh, the, the siege of Almeida again and the French trying to come back in to, uh, to relieve that siege. And uh, what happens is uh, Wellington puts his, re re very strangely, his far right flank is he puts out as uh, Portuguese partisans, guerrillas, and uh, then between them, uh, the seventh division. And there's a little bit of fighting in the town on the first day. Uh, the second day, not a lot of fighting happens. And on the third day, the, the French come widely round to the left, their left, the French right, past these partisans and capture or catch the seventh division mostly by surprise, have come up through dead grounds where they can't be seen. And the uh, 7th Division, some of them are kind of caught by surprise. And the Light Division are sent off to rescue them. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of double across uh, this flat plain. Uh, as they get close, uh, they have two are attacked uh, by the French cavalry. They form into squares. So that's the, the rock, paper, scissors moment of yep. Uh, yep. the warfare. So they suddenly, be, well, the scissors are coming towards them. They're paper in line and they suddenly form into a, a big, tough ball. And that makes them rock. Yeah. Makes them yeah. rock. Yep. Yep. And um, cavalry really can't, can't break square with very few uh, notable exceptions. Yeah. Uh, and so what they managed to do is that gives the 7th Division uh, time to kind of march back. They are now assailed like rocks in an ocean with the French cavalry around them, and mm -hmm. they are a little bit stranded. 
the light division actually move in square, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Yeah. Even like making a human pyramid and then going, right, now we're going to shuffle this to right. the side. Yeah. And that is an amazing feat of action. It's not normal. It's not really trained. If you break down the tight shoulder to shoulder, like really pushing against your comrade, a, f- a horse will force its way through that. And you are just using your bayonet as barbed wire to keep them yeah. out. Yeah. And, and, and you make a great point. You know, squares weren't broken often, but once they were, that was it for the square. They were done. Yeah. You just need about two or three horses inside with cavalrymen on the back. And they will start to, because you're, you're dr- drilled in squares facing outwards, they can just rake along the back, just, you know, cutting down onto shoulders, necks, backs of heads. Yep. And once those people start to fall back, you know, injured, if not dead, decapitated, then more horses will come in. Yep. And it's like opening a floodgate. Uh, yeah. It happens uh, most famously uh, for the British and the Germans uh, after Salamanca, where they break three squares on a single afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that's really unheard of. And the first one happens because a horse actually dies at the last minute, slams through, yeah. and the King's German Legion cavalry jump over and use that as a battering ram. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, it does happen in the Russian campaign uh, for similar reasons. They kind of capture the, the wrong moment. But it's almost impossible. We see it at Waterloo. You see the Ney's famous cavalry charge. And how many squares are broken? None. Right, right. Well, getting back to the Fuentes de Enoro, that, that's a loss for Marshal Massena. He eventually has to pull back. And I think mm. Black Bob deservedly gets promoted, correct? He does. I mean, uh, the the Light Division's actions that day save the 7th Division. Mm. Um, then Wellington, uh, the 7th Division, uh, just so people realize the nickname, uh, Wellington's Mongols. Um, <laughs> they're a real ragtag. Uh, we've got the Black Brunswickers. We've got the... Um, Chasseurs Britannique. I think we've got the 68th Durham Light Infantry in there. Yeah. Uh, but they're a real ragtag uh, bunch. Uh, they, they're, one of the, they're basically the new division that just been formed. Um, that's interesting. They, they could have been. They could have been wiped out. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting nickname right there. Um, moving on in our story, uh, in 1812, um, we get into the siege of Ciudad Rodrigo, and our friend Zach White just wrote a book which I thought was interesting, which is about sieges, or edited a book, I should say. Um, can you talk to us about, I mean, we're talking about battlefields here. Why were sieges so important? So sieges, uh, especially Suidad, Rodrigo and Badajoz, they, they need to be done. And here, especially Suidad and Badajoz, but arguably Armida as well on the Portuguese side, they are the keys to Spain. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are blocking the roads that leads out of the mountains into the flat Spanish countryside. And it is, you know, we drive over it and it's, it's steep mm-hmm. out of these and it suddenly goes flat. And you can't bypass these forts uh, with their with their cannon, you know, at every, every angle. Uh, they're also the supply route in, uh, so where they need to be taken. That's that's where it comes from. Right. Uh, and Suda Rodrigo is the first of these two. Mm-hmm. And you can't just leave you know, eight thousand enemy soldiers in your rear as you move forward. You got to take care of that fort before moving forward. Yeah. Yes, uh, it needs to be done. And uh, you know, uh, uh, people joke about me being, you know really in the in the in the church of napoleon and and wellington and mm-hmm. i'll be on the wellington side well actually i will you know always hold my hand up and he massively has got flaws from being a snob for not doing political reform but also he is not very good at sieges mm-hmm. however pseudo Rodrigo, arguably it's only a two-week siege mm-hmm. does actually do quite well yeah and i mean we're talking at a time when sieges like uh Genoa or, you know, um, uh, some of these other ones that took months, uh, Danzig, you know, that took yes. months. So, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and Badehoff, which is later, it's a harder nut to crack, but uh, it, it takes a lot longer. Yeah. And when the troops arrive at Suidad Rodrigo, you go and uh, storm a redoubt, so that's like an outlying fort meant to slow down the British. Uh, the French had actually hoped that's going to last for two weeks. It gets stormed overnight. Mm-hmm. The light division kind of come in and sweep it aside and storm in there, you know, bayonets, muskets, some short ladders and get into the redoubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, a, that's the first victory there at Suidad for, for uh, Crawford's light division. Okay. Well, um, everything's going well, but uh, tragedy strikes. What happens to our protagonist? It goes really well. Uh, the breaches are made uh, within two weeks. Um, so the, uh, the holes are made in the, in the, in the walls of the city. Right. And uh, this is normally the moment that you'd expect that the city would surrender. You know, it's it's pretty much going to go one way now, guys. There's thousands of us outside. Um, right. 
a 2,000 inside, uh, but like 10,000 plus outside uh, with lots of reinforcements and uh, re reserves. And the Allies form up and the French reinforce, but it's it's going to be, you know, tooth and nail action. Yeah. The main, the main, uh, the main breach, uh, the greater breach as it's known, uh, is going to be uh, stormed, but there's also one just down the, just down the line. And that's given to the light division, known as the lesser breach. Mm -hmm. And this is where uh, Crawford actually is literally leading them, uh, kind of like sword and hat in hand, and they're going up. So the breach itself will be all the rubble mm -hmm. that's come out of the wall, uh, the stone itself, and then the inside of the wall itself will be loosely packed uh, stones, and that's all going to be spilling down, and the men will be charging up that. Mm -hmm. and, and Crawford's seen uh, standing there, mm -hmm. kind of willing them, Willing them on, shouting at them. You know, he's he's nicknamed to his his black Bob, and uh, he's he's shouting at them to to get up, to get up. Mm -hmm. But he's hit. Mm -hmm. He's not instantly killed, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a mortal wound in this action, and uh, this is where it, he's going to be meeting his end. Yeah, I saw like um, like you said, it wasn't an initial. Like he wasn't like shot in the head and killed instantly. I think it went like over his lung and into his spine and he i believe he laid in in pain for four days before passing it's it's four days uh one of his staff officers um lieutenant shaw the 43rd uh takes him off and then he's got he's got four he's got four days and apparently really painful death really um like kind of lingering there i think it's got yeah it's got his through his side and he's got it in his back and uh he he takes a long time uh to die from that uh they actually decide to here to to bury him uh, within that breach and there's a memorial today uh two plaques one at the time and one as a, um, an anniversary yeah uh, and it, it's kind of leads to one of my favorite anecdotes uh you know we you can tell a lot about somebody when they're gone well mm -hmm. There was the funeral itself. Um, he was born by uh, sergeant majors of various regiments of the uh, light division. And when this comes out, what I'll do is I'll, I'll share a few of my favorite portraits and paintings of uh, Black Bob Crawford. Okay. Um, but one of my, there's the famous one of him directing troops, but the other, my, probably my favorite one uh, by Chris the Hook is his funeral. And they all stood there and uh, the, the sergeant majors in their coats, uh, like great coats with a sash over the top, are kind of bearing the coffin down into the into the breach mm -hmm. afterwards one of the things that he would apparently shout or even flog people for was uh, avoiding puddles so you want to see people marching on the road to be in a straight line not you know like right. stepping around and going around so apparently afterwards as they marched away the light division all found a puddle and marched through it as uh, their kind of tribute to uh, black bob crawford that's great. so that's just kind of that kind of you know, it's, it's an unpleasant thing to get wet socks, to push yourself into discomfort. And it was something that they knew that he, um, you know, hated them doing. So he that's decided amazing. to march through it. That's amazing. I've never heard that story. It's, it's, a, it's a touching, story. it's touching tribute. You know, it's like raising a, raising a glass uh, yeah. to somebody. Yeah. Now, obviously, Wellington was distraught. Um, what, what do you think his legacy was overall, Black Bob? Uh, I would say it's probably linked directly to the Light Division. Uh, he's taken them from their famous rear guard and seen them through that. Um, through Frontess is probably, um, I would say, that one of their biggest victories of the, uh, the Peninsula War is an individual action. People can argue all sorts of things. Ironically, the one they're known for is Salamanca, and actually they're on the, the outskirts of the fighting and have much lesser a role than they do at Frontess. Uh, overseeing that, and, you know, Suidad Rodrigo itself has said, you know, that he took them uh, in their not only in the main kind of storming, but very early on made it to a very short siege and solidified that reputation. The light division today are really kind of uh, synonymous with the Peninsula War and fame and victory. Mm -hmm. And he oversaw that that kind of mid to early stage that became so important to put them together. The light division grew from a brigade and grew out, uh, but people can name him as the principal commander uh, of that uh, unit and those kind of principles that we take in as as doctrine uh, are kind of usual today for fighting and he he helped the doctrine had already been written but he helped prove that those men and that kind of style uh, was successful so uh, there's a there's a military strategy element to his legacy as well as of course you know his, his nickname black bob crawford you don't know many uh, british commanders by uh, nicknames the same elements as, no. as him and, and i think there's the aspect of 
you know, he, yeah, he was a strict disciplinarian. You know, he flogged people, as you mentioned, but it was kind of the lesser of two evils by having the strict discipline and maybe penalizing two or three soldiers. He was saving the lot, right? He was saving the big group with his that, discipline. And that's where it comes from. It's for the it's for the greater good. If you fight as one unit, we we talked earlier um, about the squares. You know, that is strict discipline. You've got to have the faith in the guys either side of you, uh, but also you've got to not turn tail and run. Uh, and try to save yourself and that's where it comes down to the discipline is needed um what, the, the way he decided to go about it is controversial <laughs> um but the end result uh was you know you know top of the league uh troops really that delivered victory and ultimately you know the soldiers are there to deliver victory and he's saving lives by doing that yeah agreed Agreed. Well, I learned a heck of a lot in that episode. Uh, it was really, really good. And I appreciate you uh, enlightening us on Black Bob Crawford. And um, yeah, Marcus, thank you. You're, you're very welcome. I so say when this comes out, I'll share some pictures, get people uh, interested. Uh, and if you want to really dive down more into him, uh, Ian Fletcher wrote a book, called Robert Crawford, uh, The Man and the Myth. Uh, and I think that's online for like £25 uh, sterling. Uh, so well worth getting. It's it's huge. I've got it in front of me now. It's like 600 pages. Uh, it's, a, it's a big weighty book. Uh, yeah. There's a lot more information uh, there on him. Fabulous. Okay, I'll well, check that out on Amazon or wherever you buy books. Yeah, but uh, thanks again. And this was great. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me.